can we are you? What do I do? Just kidding. And who is it on the golden screen? It's actually Greater Yellow Legs. Say that again, please. Greater Yellow Legs. Greater Yellow Legs. Actually, greater yellow lights. I'm hearing my own feedback coming at greater me for some reason. Lights. Okay. Yellow lights. Yeah. Why? Why am I? Is that the reverb from YouTube or something going back? I'm hearing. I think my I just voice. muted it. Oh, okay. Oopsie. Let me. Um. I, I thought I just muted it. Hang on one second. Why? Why am I? Is that the reverb from YouTube or something? Yeah, I think I just muted it. All I think right. it's off now. Okay. Very good. Great. All right. Well, let's get started. Hello, everyone. So nice Yay. to see you tonight. Happy summer. Thank you all for joining us. In case you don't know who I am, I'm Lucy Helfrick from the 300 Committee Land Trust, and we are delighted to host tonight's talk with Mike Tucker called The Fascinating World of Shorebirds. Um, just a couple words about the 300 committee. We continue to be enormously grateful to all of you, our friends, members, and supporters who make it possible for us to continue to save open space here in Falmouth. Membership income underwrites the day-to-day -day work of permanently protecting high priority lands. Every parcel presented to us is screened and ranked using criteria like crit critical hab habitat, drinking water protection, linkage to existing open space, proximity to water resources and wetlands, potential for trails, and more. Our Land Acquisition Committee members conduct site visits to many of these parcels to get a feel for them. LAC recommendations to pursue acquisition are then brought to T3C's board, for, board of directors for a vote. As you're no doubt aware, land in Falmouth is becoming both more scarce and more expensive. So we face increasing challenges. Your membership enables us to continue to save important land in Falmouth for conservation, recreation, wildlife habitat, clean drinking water, farming, and more. It also helps us to manage and steward these lands and to provide outreach and educational programming, including talks like this one. For 36 years, we've been working steadily to permanently protect open space. To date, we've preserved more than 2,500 acres in all of Falmouth's villages. Our many beautiful open spaces contribute to our town's natural beauty and to all of our quality and the qu and quality of life for all of us. Access to these special places has been especially important as you all know during this last very challenging year. If you're not a member, we do hope you will consider joining us. And now I wanna turn, oh, turn things over to our speaker, Mike Tucker. Mike, I think everyone by now is familiar enough with you that we can skip the formalities. We're delighted to have you with us. Let's get started on your talk. We know you've got some beautiful photos to, to share and we are all eager to learn more about shorebirds. Great. Take it away. Well, all right, here we go. So um, I think a talk on shorebirds um, really illustrates issues in conservation probably more than any other group of birds. And we'll get into that a little bit from the get go. Um, you know, that they're fascinating birds and and for the most, most of their lives, um, two thirds to three quarters of, of a shorebird's life is, is on the move. Um, you know, they, they really spend a narrow window of time on their breeding grounds. 26 species of them will breed in the high Arctic. Um, we have a handful that, that breed around here in other parts of um, sub-Arctic North America, um, but uh, most of them do breed up in the Arctic. And we'll talk a little bit about that and, um, and some of the um, issues in conservation related to that. So migrating shorebirds, um, you know, will concentrate to small areas sometimes. Um, and we'll see a slide that illustrates that a little bit better. So, you know, any adverse effects on feeding habitat and their normal um, migration stopovers can really be uh, detrimental, um, you know. So, so they're kind of, um, you know, it, they're very fragile in, in a lot of ways even though some of the overall numbers might still be staggering, the reality is they need to find food and they need to, hold on, I need to reduce my little side screen here. Um, 
you know, and, and so that's basically what we're talking about more than anything, but there are other issues too that we'll get to. Um, but that's key. Obviously, when you're on the move, you need to be fueled up. So a lot of these areas have been, um, have, it's been getting more difficult for them to find food. A um, couple of interesting numbers here. I mentioned that, um, hold on here, sorry. I got a little issue with my side. Um, so, I mean, some will travel 15,000 miles um, on their routes each year. I mean, some of them are, are known for that. Um, you know, I, I mentioned a group of uh, birds here, this small handful of shorebirds, sandlings, turnstones, knots, et cetera. Um, they concentrate in just a handful of key areas, staging areas. Um, and I mentioned those staging areas there. Not, that's not necessarily their end um, destination, but it's in a very important stopover, these places mentioned here. And there have been a drastic decrease um, uh, in population um, with, with a lot of these birds. And uh, we'll get into that in a moment. Um, but the staggering number here is more than 80 percent of the population of certain species um, will use those five areas, um, which is really incredible when you think about it. Um, some of the um, numbers are kind of scary. Uh, since the 70s, uh, overall shorebird populations have declined 70%. Um, there's a lot of different factors involved here. Um, certainly changing climate conditions in the Arctic, but not just the Arctic. Uh, change in climbing conditions. Um, coastal development, believe it or not, hunting in the Caribbean is still a big issue. Um, there's very little regulation down there. And some of these large um, stopover spots on some of those islands, it's like taking candy from a baby and locals will just go out there and, and just shoot them like crazy. Um, and that's a big problem. There's been some efforts. I don't really know what the latest is on that to try to um, get some regulations in place and, and get things enforced. Um, but I, I, again, I don't know where we stand with that at the moment. Um, you know, it, there are certain birds that um, just are kind of like the poster child for, for these numbers. And, and uh, red knots, for example, the North American population has declined 75% since the 80s, which is huge. Um, a lot of you probably are aware that uh, Delaware Bay um, is an important stopover for the horseshoe crab eggs. And those horseshoe crab numbers have been declining drastically as well. Um, you know, that could possibly be linked to change in climate conditions as well. So I mentioned not just the Arctic, but it doesn't take much in terms of ocean temperature rise and, and the ripple effect that that may have um, leading to um, horseshoe crab numbers uh, being depleted. So that's definitely been a, a strong theory in terms of uh, horseshoe crab numbers dropping. Um, you know, the, if you uh, just glance at that um, little graphic on the right, it talks about the problem with snow geese. Um, and less than 7% of the shorebird eggs on East Bay in Southampton Island hatch, hatched successfully, which is just an abysmal rate. Whereas another island, uh, Coates Island, over 55% of them hatched, um, which isn't bad. Um, and the difference being um, Southampton, uh, East Bay and Southampton is absolutely loaded with snow geese and Coates Island doesn't have any. Um, so that's been a huge problem. Going back since the 60s, uh, Arctic uh, breeding geese, which are mostly snow geese, um, numbered around one and a half million. And since the 60s, that has ballooned to well over 20 million. And the reason why that's a big problem is because a lot of these snow geese will be breeding on an island where the shorebirds also breed. And they basically decimate the grasses. They pull them all up, they eat them. And those grasses are very important for these nests to stay protected um, for, so predators don't get at the eggs and the chicks. Um, so they're why they're exposed. Um, so, you know, the success rate has been much, much less. Um, it's been a steady decline. More predators are taking these birds and the eggs. Um, so that's one big problem associated with snow geese. Um, you know, and I mentioned the climate change. 
And so we have a subspecies of, um, of the red knots here in North America, the Russian Arctic area subspecies. They're, what they have been seeing, um, researchers have noticed that snow has been melting much sooner in the Arctic and that has thrown off the insect hatch. So basically when normally when the young hatch and during that window when they are breeding, there is an abundance of food supply, but now um, that timing hasn't worked out well at all. And so what they're finding is um, that subspecies of red knot is malnourished and the young are stunted and even in migration that presents problems for them. They're, they aren't as developed, their bill isn't as long, long, which is important for probing around when they migrate down to Africa and they're on these muddy areas. So they've seen a lot of problems associated with climate change in the Russian Arctic. Um, you know, so there's lots of stuff going on there. And uh, it just really, like I said, shorebirds really illustrate some of the current uh, problems we have with environment and development and um, a lot of issues. We're gonna get in the shorebird ID a little bit. And um, there's a lot of things to consider. Um, sometimes people get a little overwhelmed looking at shorebirds because some of them kind of look alike, kind of like the sparrows um, in a way. People look at shorebirds the same way. Um, and yeah, there are there is a group of, of shorebirds that look very similar. And we'll try to take a closer look at those and try to demystify that a little bit. Um, but certainly within shorebirds, um, you know, if there are closely related ones, some key things help distinguish them. And it might be bill length and shape. Um, certainly the shape, size and proportions and even posture of a bird. Some are more upright, some are always, some are more prone, especially when they're feeding. Leg length and color is huge. Um, plumage, which can be a little tricky. We'll get into that in a minute. But whether or not it has wing bars, tail bands, stripes, um, Fe uh, feather edging, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is when we see some good examples of it. And head patterns are always important too. Even the way they feed, um, you know, can be a behavioral cr uh, clue that can be helpful trying to figure out what you're looking at. You know, I, I've mentioned in other ID talks, uh, both physical characteristics and behavioral characteristics can be uh, very helpful when you combine them especially. Um, never try to rely on just one clue you always want to get as many clues as you can to try to figure out what it is you're looking at. Um, the habitat it's in, um, for the most part, you think, well, that can't be that different than shorebirds. But within that, um, yes, there, there are some differences there. Um, and I mentioned the plumage a moment ago. Uh, variation in plumage due to seasonal molts, age, and sex, it can be very confusing. Um, and unfortunately, a field guide couldn't possibly illustrate every um, possibility that you will see because it's a stage of molt. Um, so a lot of times, you know, it might show a full summer plumage, it might show a full um, non-breeding plumage, but it might not show some of those stages in between. And when you see those, you might scratch your head. And, and uh, so that's when you have to look at other things, look at the structure of the bird, look at some of the proportions, um, you know, see what else fits. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you wanna try to do. We're gonna start off with the plovers. Um, a bird that we do commonly see around here. Um, and by the way, I, I should state off the beginning here and off the start. If you look at the uh, numbers down below a few bullet points, 4C to 6B and then 7A to 11D, uh, the numbers are months and the letters are um, weeks within that month. So the third week of April to the second week of June is when you can kind of see the black belly plovers likely moving through on their way to their breeding grounds in the Arctic. Um, and then the uh, other numbers are when they're done breeding. Uh, you know, you see the second week of June, by the way, is, is when we don't see them anymore. And we already start seeing them the first week of July. Like I said, they aren't on their breeding grounds very long at all. And that little plus indicates that um, it's not uncommon for them to be seen outside of those dates. Um, in other words, this black belly plover um, is normally found on Christmas counts around Southern New England, even though technically they really should be out of here, but they're one that will tend to stick around sometimes. So they're a rather chunky bird, like all the plovers are to some extent, even the smaller ones have a chunky look to them. 
Um, but, you know, in breathing plumage, it's pretty easy to tell for the most part. There's another one that's pretty similar. We, we will look at that in a moment. Um, what's important to look at here on a breeding black-bellied plover, the one on the right, unfortunately, isn't full-blown breeding plumage, but it's awfully close. But a lot of that pattern is helpful to see. And one thing I want to note here is that black extends from the chin all the way down to the lower belly and kind of stops around the legs area. You notice that under tail and under rump area is white. Um, that's important to note because the very similar looking American golden plover has black all the way through that area. Sometimes they can look pretty darn close and be a little tricky. Um, in good light, you can usually figure it out. And we will look at another slide and talk about those differences in a little bit. Another key thing that you notice with the black belly plover is when they fly, they have those black armpits, if you will, the axillaries, they call them. The uh, American golden plover does not have that area. It's just clean all the way down to where it meets the body. Um, marshes, tidal flats, beaches, you'll even find sod fields. Rhode Island has a lot of places where the sod field business in South County is um, in the southern part of the state is, is still doing pretty well down there and they love finding those open areas as well. The American golden plover you'll notice has more of that golden hue, almost those flecks of gold um, on the mantle of the bird. And where I mentioned that black, you could see there that it goes all the way down to the undertail, all the way through. One of the things that I didn't mention on the last slide is that the black belly plover's wingtips meet the tail or even stop short of it. What you see here, the very end of the bird, which you may think is the tail, is actually the wingtips that extend well beyond the tail. So it has more of an elongated look to it because of that. And again, you could see um, the range maps, by the way, how many of these and how far away they do breed. The American golden plover isn't one that we see nearly as much as the black belly plover. In fact, when one is around and people are doing their bird lists and stuff, they might get a little excited and go try to find it so they can check it off for the year. Um, so it's a pretty good one to find around here. Most of them go down through the central part of the country when they migrate through. Here is a winter plumage or younger bird in flight. You could see little hints of gold in that unfortunately I did not have a shot that day of its wings lifted up so you can see that it does not have, <clears throat> excuse me, it does not have those black armpits because the uh, black belly plover, no matter what plumage it is in, will show that even in this similar uh, stage of plumage that the American golden is in here. So I'll talk about some of the differences with these two birds now, after I get rid of this box that's in my way. There we go. You can't see it, so that's good. Um, so the American golden plover, you can see really well here, those wingtips I'm talking about, how they extend past the tail. If you look closely, the bird on the right, the black belly plover, it comes right to the tail end. Um, it's not a huge difference, but you do see it if you look for it. Another thing to look for is that contrasting dark cap. If you notice, the black belly plover does have that darkish cap, and it can be very subtle. Um, you know, a lot of books and people will say, oh, the American Golden has a darker cap. It's not so much that I look for as I look for the contrast between the cap and that white supercilium, that little streak of white you see over the eye there. That contrast is really the key thing to look at because lighting can be pretty tricky. Another important thing to note here, a couple, bill size. It's a much thinner and pointier bill on the American Golden and that thicker, heavier bill on the black bellied. The one thing that I find most helpful if I'm fairly close is the streaking pattern when birds are in these non-breeding plumage. If you look at the black bellied on the right, it has these vertical streaks that come down the chest and they kind of, you could see some of those faint streaks on the flanks as well. It's difficult to see in this American golden plover, but it's the kind of the opposite. It's, it's horizontal barring or even spotting once it gets past the neck area. Um, so they kind of go the other way. And that's very helpful. So if you get in views of that, be a little confused on bill size, which isn't always easy to gauge because even within a particular species, you can have one with a rather large bill or one with a rather small, small bill. So, you know, get as many, again, as many clues as you can gather 
um, and structurally seeing that tail uh, to wing ratio is very helpful. And all those clues can really come into play. And if it flies, it makes it real easy because you get to see those armpits or not, or those dark areas. It's a much smaller cousin, the semi-palmated plover are just adorable little birds, um, cute as anything. And they even make cute little sounds. They are doing pretty well numbers wise. They are all declining, but it's all relative, I suppose. When you go to a mud flat, whether it's down in Southern Rhode Island, like the Charlestown Breachway, or you're out at Bell's Neck, um, when they're moving through, you're likely going to see a bunch of them together. They look um, exactly like in shape wise and proportions a piping clover, but they're much darker. See that kind of dark sand color they have, and they have that um, very distinct band around the neck. They are just adorable little birds, and you will see them foraging around mud flats. Sometimes they'll find large open fields where there might be puddles after storms, those sort of things. Pretty easy to tell, though. You're not going to confuse them with a whole lot if you really pay attention to the color compared to a piping clover which is much, much paler, the color of pale sand. You know, a breeding piping plover, that neck band varies quite a bit. Sometimes they're incomplete, sometimes they're complete. Many, many years ago when I was doing plover uh, work on one of the, when I worked for Fish and Wildlife for a season, one of the things I did was note the markings on the neck so we can sort of tell which individuals are doing what. And I would have a sketchbook and I would basically draw that particular neck band. And they were all unique and individual. Um, you know, when they get to their non-breeding plumage later on in the season, they look like the picture down below. You see just a hint of that neck band. The, black, the dark black completely disappears and the bill color even changes, um, especially with the juvenile. I believe sometimes you get that color remaining with an adult winter plumage. I'd have to double check that now that I say that out loud. So this bird, it's interesting because I believe they were taken off the federal endangered list because a lot of conservation efforts that have brought them back. But, um, you know, we certainly can't let our foot off the gas in terms of efforts to keep them protected because these birds love to nest where people love to go, where people love to sunbathe, where people love to park their boats on a nice, beautiful summer day. So it's difficult to you know, yes, we have a lot of areas protected for them, but any changes in those areas, um, you know, are, are more, more substantial to this bird's well-being than other birds that are much more diverse in where they can nest and, and, and you know, birds that have a much wider range. So their habitat is, is pretty narrow. So we really need to keep a close eye on it. It wouldn't take much for their population to turn around and, and head south again. So far, so good where these areas are protected. And, um, you know, we have this East Coastal population and they're out in the Midwest and Plains and some of the Western Great Lakes area as well. Um, cute little bird. It's interesting. I, I, I love old field guides and I have an old, old one, turn of the 20th century that um, I loved reading a lot of the ex excerpts from it. And when they talked about piping plovers, one of the things they mentioned how it was an excellent bird for youth to go hunting. Um, you know, so things have changed a whole lot, um, but it's just kind of really interesting to see some of the takes on birds back in the day. Killdeer love nesting in these wide open areas, and sometimes it's not the spot you would expect a shorebird to nest. We call them shorebirds, and they will find shore areas, but they certainly nest, as you can see the range map, throughout North America. Any of these wide open dry spots that have sparse vegetation, whether it's the edge of a ball field, um, the grassy areas of an airport, uh, the rooftop of a Walmart, you name it, they'll find it and uh, they'll nest. So they're doing pretty well because of that. They seem to be very adaptable and you definitely know when they're around because they're extremely vocal. They say their namesake over and over and over again. Around Falmouth, I think probably most of the people on this talk are uh, probably from the Falmouth area. We certainly have a great spot in Crane Wildlife Refuge area off of Route 151. It's a grassland, but it's a sparse type of grassland. It's not a thick sod forming sort of grass. So you, in fact, that's where I took this photo and the next ones you will see. 
the next ones I just had to throw in here because aren't they cute? Um, yes, killdeer chicks, um, they really don't get much cuter than that. What's really fun about plovers is, is watching their behavior and their strong maternal instincts they have. It's just kind of cool to see. So piping plovers and, and killdeer, they each kind of do their own thing if they think there's a threat nearby. Killdeer will feign a broken wing. They'll go hopping around and, and do these short little flights like they're having a hard time flying to distract the predator to go after them instead of the babies. Um, this bird here that day didn't seem to perceive me as a threat. I just got on the ground on my belly and these guys came out walking around and she was keeping a close eye, but she never went into that sort of behavior of like, oh no, oh no, danger, danger. I need to draw that predator away. And, and it all ended up well. And these guys just kept walking in front of my camera for me. Whoops. <laughs> I forgot to add that picture in there. American oyster catcher, isn't it beautiful? You know what, I could probably I tell you what, later on I will go back to an earlier slide I have of, of, an, an, American oyster, of an American oyster catcher. Sorry about that folks. We saw it uh, earlier. Yeah, yeah, it was in the feeding slide uh, earlier. Yeah, I believe it had a, a um, mussel shell in its bill. I'll go back to that later on if we have time. They're a cool bird. They're one of the ones that also nest around here like piping clovers and killdeers. Again, not a whole lot of them nest around here compared to what nests in the Arctic, but we do have a handful. They're large birds and just colorful, that bright orange bill. And uh, we'll talk about those maybe if we have time and I'll go back to that photo. Um, very striking bird. I figured I'd throw this in here because you just never know. Um, they have shown up around here. In fact, I went down to the marsh over by Seagull Beach, I think it was. I'm trying to remember where it was last fall and saw one of these. This is not my photo. A friend of mine uh, lent me a few photos to use for this particular talk. But just a, an incredibly elegant looking bird. You can see the range map here. So obviously they're stunning to look at and rare. So when they show up, they definitely draw a lot of attention. They just, they sweep their bill around. Watching them feed is a real treat too. The way they go running around, sweeping that bill from side to side. It's a lot of fun. Incidentally, um, notice that this bird looks like it has one leg. It's very common, even those long gangly legs, there's a whole lot of feathers on a bird. It disappears within the bird. Um, and they'll do that to conserve to te for temperature regulation, um, you know, sometimes on a really hot day, they might do that. Even on a really cold day, they might do that. And they'll move them back and forth. And it reminds me of a phone call I, I received once when I was working at Audubon. And forgive me if you've heard this story before in another talk. But um, yeah, Audubon, the headquarters, diverted her call to me. And she said, I'm really concerned. I was walking there against a beach. And I saw several birds with one leg. And you know, she just went on like she was just really troubled by this. And I tried to calm her down and say, look, you know, this is actually normal. They, they do have two legs. Um, you know, they, they, I explained why they do that and they pull it up. And if you watched them long enough, you would probably see that, you know, they would put them down and when they take off, you would see them in flight. So I seemed to calm her worries a little bit. And then three months later, when the birds were in migration again, she said, I don't know if you remember me, but I called about the birds with one leg. She says, well, I'm really worried now because there's a whole lot of them. So she didn't really listen to anything I had to say. So she thought there was like some sort of strange deformity or something grabbing birds' eggs, uh, legs, apparently. But anyway, they were fine. That's normal. And you'll see that with a lot of different shorebirds. This one is another elegant looking Western and Southern species as well. You can see the range map. They do nest down in Florida and a couple of areas along the southeastern US. Despite being not that far from us, they really don't show up here a whole lot. Rarely do they make it to the Northeast. This back in, I, I believe it was May, did make it to the Northeast. This was over by Sandy Neck in uh, Barnstable. And I raced out there that morning when I heard about it and managed to get a few shots, including this one but they are just such a cool looking bird. I mean, they just had that jet black and white pattern and tough to find around here. And it was my first one for Barnstable County. So I was happy to get some photos of it. 
getting into some ones we see around here quite a bit. And you notice the, um, the range of dates. We have the th uh, fourth week of March till early June. And then in July, we have them around for quite a bit. You know, they'll hang around well, well throughout the fall and into early winter sometimes, especially places like southeast of Massachusetts where we are buffered by the ocean here and sometimes it just doesn't get super cold and they still find food. Um, you know, what really makes these guys unique from the, its cousin, the lesser yellow legs, you wanna look at a few things. You wanna look at that bill, first of all. It's a rather long bill. It's longer than the width of its head considerably and is usually a slight up curve to it. Keep in mind, and Sibley has an interesting page on this, that there is variation with bill length with both greater and lesser. So sometimes you may find one that's on the lower spectrum or, or, or a lesser that has one on the higher spectrum. So you, again, you wanna look as, for as many clues as you can. With this bird on the right, the tail, the wing feathers extend slightly past the tail, which believe it or not, you don't usually see. Usually they meet the tail, but on a lesser, it's always noticeably past the tail, those wingtips. Another key thing to look at here is that barring that you see right underneath the wing. It's subtle, sometimes it's more heavy, especially in a more high breeding plumage bird. This bird isn't in high breeding plumage, but that barring goes down underneath the wing, what we call the flanks area and extends back. On a lesser, you don't see that. It's all completely clean underneath the wing. You notice a non-breeding bird on the left, it's very difficult to see that barring. So you need to be careful. That's why, again, you wanna get as many clues as you can. It's a larger bird. When you see the two of them side by side, you'd say, geez, how could I ever confuse the two? But when you see one by itself, either one, it's not always easy to gauge size. It's a lot trickier than people realize when it's just feeding by itself out there in the marsh or the water. Another thing that um, some field guides will point out, and it's difficult to see in this, but you can see it a little bit. Notice that the bill tip and is all dark all the way down to the towards the base of the bill, and it's much paler at the base of the bill. That's not the case with the lesser yellow legs. It's a uniform sort of color from the base of the bill all the way to the tip. Sometimes it's more noticeable. And of course, when they're feeding in mud, a lesser yellow leg might look like its tip is much darker than the base of the bill too. So there's a lot of tricky things. Again, more clues, the better. And we will... You can see they're not a high arctic nester, by the way. Um, that sort of peachy color is, is their breeding range. So this is the lesser yellow legs. Notice the bill is straighter. And this does have that muddy tip I was talking about. Otherwise, it would be pretty much uniform color that you see at the base of the bill there. Also notice the wingtips extend well beyond. And it's leaning forward. If this bird was more upright, um, those wingtips would extend noticeably even further beyond that tail tip. And they have a more sleeker look. Those longer wings, or proportionally longer wings, I should say, give it a more elongated look. Their head is usually smaller and rounder looking. They just have this petite look to them. Their, their body isn't as heavy as a grater. Some of those things can all be tricky in the field when you're looking at a bird by itself. But generally speaking, it's gonna look like a sleeker, thinner, kind of more petite looking bird. Here's a couple of graphics here to show that bill length. It's much longer proportionately on the greater. Um, and then on the lesser, you could see that straighter bill as well. Closely related to the yellow legs, we do have nesting around here, is willet. And willet are fun because they're just so vocal and always flying around out in the open. You could go to South Cape Beach and you got that big marsh over there, a couple sections of marsh where they nest all over the place in there. In fact, the picture on the right was one of the posts for the bridge over by South Cape Beach. I was just walking away from the beach and it just landed right there screaming away. I'm like, all right, I'll take your photo. And the other one was Great Sipawissip Marsh, the flying bird. That broad white barring uh, a stripe, I should say, that goes down the wings is a really good field mark. How it contrasts with the dark, the really dark areas of the wing really jumps out at you. That's unique. Nothing like a yellow legs has. Because at first glance at a distance, um, you know, it has those long legs, it has that fairly long bill, 
you might think yellow legs instantly. Um, but when you take a closer look, you'll notice that the bill is heavier and the legs are a little bit heavier as well, but they also don't have that bright yellow. It's just that dull sort of fleshy color. And they are very vocal, uh, much, much different sound than what the, the uh, yellow legs make. And by the way, we do have um, an Eastern population. It's not very big, but we do have an Eastern population and we see a lot of those. But later on in the fall, we get a lot of the Western willets. And now this bird here is more in breeding plumage. When it's in winter plumage, it actually looks pretty close to these, um, but these are still much more smoother and paler looking than what the Eastern willet gets when it's in its winter plumage. Solitary sandpiper, not always easy to find. It's a little different than some of the other ones we looked at uh, other than maybe kill deer um, because they aren't necessarily at the shore. These guys will find freshwater ponds, even large puddles, gravel pit puddles in migration. They'll find places like that. They don't really breed in New England, but we'll see them later on in the fall. We'll see them in the spring in May is usually a pretty good time. And when you do see them, you'll notice a few different things in their behavior. They bob around a lot, especially when they land from flying. And when they fly, they'll hold their wings in a stiff sort of fluttery down curved manner in between their flaps. It's very distinct. Well, I say very distinct. The, the next bird we're gonna look at also does something very similar. So we'll focus on some of the key differences between this bird and the next one we will be looking at. Um, again, you know, wet meadows, small ponds, freshwater places. This was actually taken at um, Red Brook Reservoir on Red Brook Road, Falmouth Mashpee Line, when it got drained and there were just tons of shorebirds all over the place there. In fact, the uh, fallow rope that's over my head in my background picture here was taken there as well, the Wilson's fallow rope. <clears throat> but notice the bold white eye ring that's complete. It goes all the way around on a rather plain face. And notice that the back is speckled with white. Those are a couple of very key things to look at here. And it's a little different than a lesser yellow legs. They can look similar at first glance. The bill length is probably somewhat similar, but it has different proportions and that speckled brown, that speckled white on a brown back and the legs aren't nearly as bright. It's more of a greenish color than a yellowish color. And when we look at the spotted sandpiper, these pictures, they look very different. The winter or juvenile picture on the right, it's, it can be tough for people because they have almost a complete eye ring. There's always that dark line that you could see going through the face that somewhat interrupts the eye line. The solitary does not have that dark line across the face. It's more of a plain face, but there is no speckling at all on the back. The leg color is similar. The shape is almost identical. The size is almost identical and they'll show up in identical places. They'll show up in these freshwater ponds and puddles and those sort of places as well. And they also bob around a lot like they spotted. I mean, like a solitary. But what's confusing is, we'll back up, look at all the spots. And then a lot of times in migration, we see the one on the right and that's called the spotted sandpiper even though there are no spots, but that's because it's breeding plumage on the left its belly and throat areas is highly spotted. But you can see their breeding range. They do very, very well. Um, there are places around Southern New England where they nest. They aren't a common nester, but they are around for sure. They are more common in other areas than what we have around here. This is a large bird, um, 17 and a half inches long, 32 inch wingspan. It's a, it's a very hefty bird. I took this over at that same marsh where um, I saw the Avocet. Yes, the Avocet. And this bird is kind of fun because they just jump out at you. You'll see all of a sudden a bunch of shorebirds fly up and you just see this one huge bird with this giant down curved bill. I've seen a number of them out by Provincetown where you take the back path out to the lighthouse across the marsh. That's a great place for them. Great Sipawissip Marsh. I've seen them in there. South Cape Beach, another good spot. But there is, you're not gonna confuse it with a whole lot. That striped head you see is unique, that down curved bill and the overall size. And it mentions here, they pick rather than probe for food. 
you're not going to need that for an ID, but just an interesting tidbit. You kind of see them always kind of moving their head up and down. They're not really like digging deep like some of the other shorebirds do that have long bills. It's a beautiful bird that shows up once in a while. And sometimes they will be around well into late in the, late in the fall. So notice the range map here. We definitely don't get a lot of them here. Most of them do move down through the central part of the country, the continent. But they are really elegant looking birds. That bill goes the other way uh, that the windbrill does. It has that gentle slope up. But when you wanna look at a couple of things, ID wise comparing this to the next bird we're gonna look at, you wanna look at that white um, pattern on the underwing that shows the dark lining with the, the white that goes alongside that dark lining. That is very key. The pale plain back without really any kind of pattern on it. It's, it's rather flat and unpatterned. Those are key things to look at. And we will compare it to the marble god whip, which has a much more modeled sort of look to the back, has a very similar bill. And the underwing pattern is much different than the one we just looked at though. We saw those dark wing linings with the white stripe that kind of outlined that wing lining. With these guys, they have this uh, bright cinnamon color that goes throughout the wing. So beautiful bird and really uh, catches your eye when one of these is around. It gets a lot of attention. People usually will go out of their way when they hear one is around and go seek it out. We don't get a lot of them, that's for sure. We do get quite a few of these though, ruddy turnstones. In fact, where I am in Falmouth, there's a couple of places. Um, Woodneck Beach is a great place where they winter over here, no problem at all. Again, you see that little plus sign next to the 10A. And certainly Cape Cod is a good place for them, Southern Rhode Island as well, where you can find some winter populations of them. More often than not, in the winter, they will look like the bird on the bottom much more dull. They'll retain that sort of dark collar you see, but it's not as vibrant as a bird that's more breeding. And the one here isn't in high breeding plumage. There's a couple of things there that might be a little different, might have a little bit more rufous on the back color, but that is pretty much a breeding bird on the right. So you will see these along rocky beaches. They love turning stones. I actually have seen them do that. I've yet to get a good video of that, um, their namesake and actually catch them in the act. I have a few photos of it that don't really illustrate it so well. But any of these places that have like the rack line where, you know, this is just a whole bunch of junk that gets washed up. You'll see them walking through there feeding. They'll have flocks. The ones, the flock at Woodneck Beach will be anywhere from 12 to 30 or so in the winter time. You'll see they'll move around between there and, and Black Beach. And they just kind of stick to that whole little coastal area during the winter time. Those bright legs really jump out at you, much brighter than other birds in the same size range. And they are still fairly bright in the wintertime, not, not quite the same as what you see in breeding plumage. We talked a little bit about the red knot earlier with um, the problems they're facing and the numbers crashing 75% since the 80s, which is really just horrible. And I'm old enough now and I've been birding long enough where I've witnessed that difference. Um, there used to be places I would go in Rhode Island in the summer where I would see dozens of them. And now they're tough to find. The, the numbers, it's really pretty scary uh, watching the, these numbers crash. I mean, heck, I graduated high school in 85 and as soon as I got a car in 84, I was bird watching all over the state. I was always excited to come across these guys. Now it's a bigger deal. When you find a red knot, people spread the word. They're like, hey, there's a red knot down at Napa Tree Point. Sometimes we get a handful of them moving through there. Um, but yeah, it's just not the same anymore. They are very chunky birds. In their winter plumage, you see a very pale sort of back to them that has a little light scaling on the edge of the feathers. That's a good sort of field mark with this bird. So a rather large chunky bird you're not gonna see any bold markings, but you're gonna see a rather plain back with that little bit of scaling. Usually that's what you're going to see around here. Sometimes you get the full adult winter plumage. I've only actually seen that a few times in the Northeast, um, but you know, they're around, but you, you're not gonna mistake it for anything else when you come across it, that's for sure. Everybody's familiar with the sandalings. If you take a long walk along a beach in the winter time, 
So they actually will winter along our coast, no problem at all. You can see where they breed way up in the high Arctic islands, but you know they don't need to go that far. Some of them do. A lot of them will do the coastal areas all the way down to South America, no problem at all. But we get a significant population of them around here. Some of the key things you wanna look for, there's always this dark area in the shoulder. And the picture on the left is really the plumage that we see during the winter time. And the white feathers are kind of covering that dark spot that I wanted to illustrate here. So I probably should have put up a better picture of that. But even the breeding plumage in that part of the shoulder shows the darker feathers. Breeding plumage can be a little tricky because you're so used to seeing them in the winter plumage. So every now and then, if you catch one around in, in the summertime, um, you know, maybe before they're heading up to the breeding grounds, you may see that rusty colored sort of head and rich colored back that's got the little bit of black and rufous mixed in. But again, you want to look for other things. You want to look for that dark area in the shoulder. The size is unique, so it's larger than what a semi-palmated sandpiper might look like, for example. A semi-palmated, excuse me, semi-palmated sandpiper might have some similar features at first glance, but these birds are larger. And when they fly, they have a unique wing pattern that really sticks out. Um, that broad stripe that goes down the entire length of the wing is a little bit more bold than what the sandpipers have. And uh, yeah, so keep an eye out for these. I've already seen a couple around the spring and I have caught them in breeding plumage, but once we get in the fall, we'll see them all over the beaches around here. So the semi palmated sandpiper I was just talking about, these can be a little tricky. Now we get into the birds where people will confuse some of them a little bit. So I'll talk about some of the key things here. So they are similar in size to a least sandpiper and a western sandpiper, but these are smaller. Uh, I'm sorry, the least are smaller, um, but you really need to see them side by side and notice that difference. And I actually have a slide where we will see that in a little bit. Generally speaking, they don't have that same warm color as a least sandpiper has. However, you notice the juvenile on the left has a little bit of that warm color in the scapulars and down the back and head. That's common. Um, but a least sandpiper will have yellow legs. It will not have those black legs. And if you look closely at the feet on that picture on the left, you will see why it is called a semi-palmated sandpiper. Those toes are, palma are palmated a little bit, slightly webbed between the toes. And the uh, least sandpiper doesn't have that. And of course it has the yellow legs. However, I have seen least sandpipers with completely black mud covered legs that might make you <laughs> think, oh, that's a semi-palmated sandpiper. So you do wanna look for other things. That bill is usually noticeably different between the two species. It's usually more stout and straight looking on a semi-palmated sandpiper. It usually has more of a droop on a least sandpiper. And we'll look at a least sandpiper in a moment, but first we're gonna look at Western sandpiper because that is all also often confused with semi-palmated sandpiper. Before I switch to the next slide, keep in mind the juvenile uh, photo on the left here. And the juvenile photo on the right can sometimes look very similar to that Western, I'm sorry, semi-palmated sandpiper. The bird on the left would be more of what you would see in a breeding plumage, which we do get here once in a while. But if you look at the range map, it's usually the immatures we get because it's really not where we get them routinely in big numbers, although they do seem to be increasingly showing up in Southern New England, but usually the ones that stray a little bit further from their normal path are usually the juveniles anyway. So more often than not, what we see with the Western sandpipers look like the bird on the right. And what really jumps out at you here is that contrast in scapular area that has that reddish color compared to the plain, more dull rest of the back. And that is a really good field mark for this bird. And again, a juvenile um, semi-palmated sandpiper might have something similar, but look at that bill. It's much longer and the bill on the left probably shows it a little bit better, but both birds show that longer drooping bill. And that is much different than what you would see in a semi-palmated sandpiper. And as it lifts its foot up, you could see on the right, that there is no palmate, uh, palmation between the toes there, um, not nearly what a semi-palmated sandpiper has. 
So keep an eye out for these. One little thing to look for with these, and this isn't diagnostic by any means, but just something to look for. If you come across a large flock of shorebirds, one of the places I love to go, a favorite spot of mine in Rhode Island, when I see a whole bunch of them feeding in shallow water or on the mud, one of the first things I do is scan the slightly deeper water. The Western sandpipers tend to wade around in the water more, wade around in the water more than the least in the semi-palmated sandpipers. So I always look for that. It's just a little side note. It's like I said, certainly isn't diagnostic and they will feed on the mud. Obviously these pictures were both taken in the mud as well. But these are the sort of things I scan for when there's a large flock of shorebirds. I'll look at the back colors. I'll look at bill shape. It, it can be overwhelming sometimes when there's hundreds of shorebirds there. So you're just looking for something that jumps out at you a little bit to get a closer look. The least sandpiper is the smallest of them all. Um, but the, again, the size difference isn't huge. <clears throat> you can notice that the warmer colors of the juvenile, just like the other two species we looked at, but overall, the entire bird is much warmer looking. So you don't have just that sort of reddish scapula area. All the feathers seem to have that tinge and edging to them. And notice that the bill is also drooping a little bit compared to the semi-palmated sandpiper that, where it's more straight and stout looking. Again, the Western sandpiper has a drooping bill, but it's longer and it's noticeably longer. And they also have black legs. And the adult doesn't have those sort of edgings. It's more of a plain dark back that you see on the right. Most of the ones we do see here do seem to be juveniles. And of course, timing and when you see these birds come into play a little bit with that as well. So here you see a leaf sandpiper on the left and the semi-palmated sandpiper on the right. So you do get a good feel for a size difference there a little bit. Um, sometimes that's not even that noticeable, but for whatever reason, this head-on shot of these two made it a whole lot easier for me. Maybe. You could notice the, uh, the feet, the dark legs, the overall size, the bill difference. White rump sandpiper is something that, again, going back to that idea of scanning across a mud flat full of shorebirds. So least sandpipers and semi-palmated sandpipers and semi-palmated plovers are all these little tiny guys. And you know they're gonna take up a big percentage of the shorebirds you're scanning through. But these guys are a little bit bigger. So one of the things I look for are these medium-sized shorebirds. What we usually see in migration here, because we get much more of these on their downward journey, um, you notice the 7D through 11B. Again, these guys sometimes are found on Christmas counts, not too often, but they'll linger into December once in a while. I had one in November last year. So I'll talk about that plumage on the right because that's what we really usually see. Notice that little white flag over the eye. That's what I call it anyway. A lot of people call it that actually. So that kind of jumps out on the plain face. It really is, it's distinct. It's, it's not really like a stripe that goes from the bill all the way behind the eye. It's just this little flag that people seem to call it. The back is very plain. It doesn't really have hard markings and hard edgings, whether it's, um, edged in white. It's just this very muted. All the markings tend to be muted in this plumage. Like it's almost like somebody smudged them all with a thumb and kind of sm smoothed everything over. A key thing to notice here, two key things. The tail feathers, the bird on the left shows it very well, extend, I'm sorry, the wing feathers extend well past the tail. And that's key. The birds we looked at so far, the other peeps, so to speak, the semi-palmated sandpipers, the least and the westerns, their tail feathers do not extend past, uh, their wing tips, I'm sorry, do not extend past the tail. And they do with this bird and it's noticeable. So again, it gives it that elongated look and the markings going down the flanks, it's subtle. You could see it on both the breeding and the non-breeding birds, but those little flecks going on underneath the wing, sometimes it's more prominent than what that picture on the right shows in its winter plumage, but it's always there to some degree. So those, it has the dark legs, the long wings, the little white flag, and those, those markings going down the flanks. Those are all very key things that you will notice with this bird. Baird sandpiper is one that gets a lot of attention because it's just a beautiful bird. It has that buff look throughout the breast and you know, it really jumps out at you. It has a different overall coloration 
than the least of the semi-palmated sandpipers. And notice the white edging on, on those back feathers and wing feathers. And it also, like the white rumped sandpiper, has the wingtips that extend past the tail. Um, so this bird has the black legs. It will not have the similar feet to the semi-palmated sandpiper, but that overall buffy color, the white edging, and the long uh, wingtips that go past the tail are all key things to look at here. Mention here that they are sometimes found on, found on sod farms. That's not really a thing here on the Cape, um, but certainly other places where you have those sort of habitats um, it's definitely worthwhile looking for them, especially in the fall after rainstorms. A lot of these birds will drop down during rainstorms where you'll see a whole bunch of shorebirds on these sod farms just running around. And they're nice to see them there because there's really nothing to obstruct your view. They're just sitting wide out in the open. Notice their migration patterns. So you see why it's a pretty big deal here. They pretty much do a straight shot right down through the center of North America. But, you know, this one I actually got back in August or September down in Charlestown, Rhode Island. So I lucked out. I was going out there with a friend and she spotted it first and I just sat there and it eventually walked right in front of me. Pectoral sandpiper looks basically like a leaf sandpiper on steroids. Um, it has the yellow legs. It has a similar back pattern, although there's more edging on the feathers. It has a similar shaped bill, but it's a little longer and heavier. And it's usually a little more down curved than a least. But what's really key about this bird is that breast pattern has a dense, uh, dense streaking that abruptly ends. So that's kind of like that strong line of demarcation where you have the dense streaking, boom, you got the white lower belly area. It's just, it's a cutoff. With the other ones we've looked at, it's more diffuse and it just kind of blends in, but it's definitely noticeable with a pectoral sandpiper. They're chunkier, they're heavier, the male is noticeably larger. So if you see a female, you might think, well, geez, that doesn't look that big, but it's still gonna have the same sort of pattern. It's gonna have that very distinct breast pattern. It's still gonna look chunkier for its size. They all have a plump look, plump look to them. Um, but this was taken also, uh, this was taken at uh, Redbrook Reservoir as well when all those shorebirds dropped in after the pond breached. Purple sandpiper isn't something that we get in huge numbers in the winter time on Cape Cod. There are a few places where they show up. It's an overwintering bird that will find rocky shorelines. It might be turbulent water where the waves are always crashing on some rocks. And it could be, you know, just a jetty sticking out where that's happened here in Falmouth a few times where they might find a spot on a jetty where the waves are crashing and they kind of fly up and down when the really big waves hit. But for whatever reason, they just like that sort of habitat. Um, you know, in Rhode Island, there are a number of places, Napa Tree Point um, has a rocky area off to the backside, Beaver Tail, Satch West Point. So, you know, they show up in better numbers there because there's more of a hard rocky coastline there than what Cape Cod has, but they can be found out here as well. You usually see large flocks of them. You're not going to generally see just one hanging out on the rock. And you see them, like I mentioned here, 20 or 50 is common. I've seen even larger ones. Another wintering bird we have is the Dunlin. You can see their breeding range around the west side of Hudson Bay and north up around Alaska. So these guys are way, way up there. And one of the ones that has been studied, uh, their numbers are pretty much in a steady decline as well. Although this past winter and previous winters have had decent numbers of them mixed in with those ruddy turnstones at Woodneck Beach I talked about. In the wintertime, you'll often see them with mixed in with ruddy turnstones and sandalings. So they'll find these sort of beaches and just all run around together. And, you know, if you see a big flock and you see mostly sandalings, just start scanning through them and you may come across a dunlin. What you'll notice is a much longer bill than a sandaling. You'll notice that long down curved bill. And you're not gonna see that black belly most of the time, especially in the winter. But when they're first showing up or when they're moving through, if you're catching them up north, sometimes you'll get a tinge of that color a little bit of that black belly underneath. If you get really lucky, you will catch one in full blown breeding plumage, um, which I haven't seen a whole lot, but I have come across a lot of Dunlin that still have a trace of that lower black belly sort of hanging out before they lose it completely. But keep an eye out. We certainly get those routinely 
And um, there are a number of places. Sandy Neck is a great place for them along with the sandlings. So good bird to get around here. This is a tough one, however. The buff-breasted sandpiper showed up out in Provincetown this past uh, spring, I believe, or I think the fall too, but I missed it. I was out there one day when other people had it. They're not always gonna be where the other shorebirds are. Sometimes they are, but they'll find those sod fields. They'll find um, sparse growth, weedy fields sometimes. Um, you know, they will find the back dunes areas, you know, where you have a lot of the dune grass and then maybe there'll be some wide open sandy areas. Sometimes they'll go hide in those spots. And I think that's what one of them was doing out in Provincetown. You, you aren't always going to see them feeding along mud flats and along the shoreline. They will come out and do that. But it seems like when they're roosting and hanging out, they like to get into these areas away from the water a little bit. But they have that very plain looking face where the eye just seems like it just jumps out, almost like a, a dove kind of shaped head to it. And overall, you had that buff wash through the breast and the face and even on the back a little bit. And the back is always scaled with that white edging like we sort of talked about with the Baird sandpiper. The buff breasted sandpiper will always show that when we get them around here. Unfortunately, I haven't had this one on Cape Cod yet, even though they breed on Cape Cod. I've missed it when people have spotted it at Crane Wildlife Refuge in Falmouth. Um, they stop in there now and then. I, I imagine it's possible that they may breed there eventually, but to the base north of there, along the runways and some of the grassy areas, apparently they do pretty well over there. Um, I've heard that there are several that nest along those grassy areas and margins of the airport. So that's good news. There aren't many places around southern New England where they are nesting. New England in general, it's a good bird to have nesting locally. One of these days I'll get lucky and, and get one of them around here. I've had them in Rhode Island a number of times, but they're kind of large. Um, you know, they, they love sitting up on fence posts. They might find a big farm field somewhere and sit up on a fence post um, right out in the open and just pose for people. I've never had that happen myself, but <laughs> I've seen plenty of photos of it. And they have this really crazy song. If you ever, I'm not even going to try to imitate it, but I, I recommend Googling that and listening to the song of a upland sandpiper. It's kind of comical, actually. <clears throat> Still sandpipers will show up in places around here, Cape Cod and migration. They, they, they don't show up in big numbers. Most of them do go down through the central part of North America, but they're always fun to come across. They, they kind of, they're sort of goofy looking in a way. You know, they, they, do, they are aptly named. They sit up kind of high. Their legs almost don't seem to fit their body. They do have that down curved bill. It's somewhat long. They do have that unique pattern on the face. And a lot of times when we see them here in July, um, they'll have that little bit of that reddish auricular, that little rusty area behind the eye um, is something that is good to look for. Sometimes you get that sort of in-between plumage where they aren't so heavily barred underneath, but there's a trace of that. And then there's still a little bit of that ear patch, uh, if you want to call it, left behind. Again, it can be really tricky with shorebirds because again, you're not going to get a field guide that's going to show you everything you could possibly see with these shorebirds. So you want to look at structure. You're going to notice that the legs are long, but they're not as brightly colored as the yellow legs. Um, so without looking at the bill and the, and the rest of the bird, you might think yellow legs by looking at the shape of it in general, but that bill is different than a greater yellow legs actually has that up curved bill and the lesser yellow legs has the straight bill. Um, neither one of them had that heavy of barring underneath. So, you know, you just sort of sort things out like that and try to figure out what is, what is unique to this bird compared to something I'm more familiar with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me while I blow my nose. <laughs> Closely related to the stilt sandpipers, taxonomically anyway, is the short-billed dowitcher. So their legs are fairly long as well, but they have a more chunky appearance. The bill's a little heavier. The bill is straighter. Although the short-billed dowitcher does have a slight droop to it, but not as dramatic as the stilt sandpiper. But you can notice that the bill length is much longer 
even though it's called short-billed dowager. The reason why it's called short-billed dowager is because it has a cousin named the long-billed dowager. And they are not easy to ID, and I'm not gonna, I mean, it can, you can ID the difference, um, you know, with field marks, but I'm not gonna get into that. Uh, we'll just talk about what we see here. They have that chunky look, the long bill, and they'll find muddy areas and sometimes just roost and turn their bill around. And you'll see like a group of like six, eight, ten of them just all sitting all close together with their bill tucked around on the back. Um, they're cool, they're kind of cute looking, and um, but always sort through them. If one does look a little different, if one does seem to have some markings that don't seem to match the others, it's possible you might have a long bill dowager. Normally, we don't get long bill dowagers even showing up in the spring. When it happens, it's usually later in the fall, but it can happen. So I am going to pretty much end it here. And I want to thank uh, Paul Etois for letting me borrow a lot of his photos. And of course, I always thank the 300 committee because of all the wonderful work they do. I really lucked out finding this organization here in town. Um, what they do is incredible, like no other land trust I've ever seen. And I've been involved with other land trusts. So kudos to them. And, and I hope they, uh, they get a, continue to get a good following. And that is all I have. And there is my email. If anybody has any questions and wants to ever email me for anything, please feel free. There I am. Okay. And if there's any questions, thank you so much, Mike. It doesn't look like anybody has posted any questions in the chat. Oh, um, maybe I put them to sleep. That's why. Well, no, I think we're just also just bowled <laughs> over by the gorgeous photographs. Um, Really, what a lovely talk and so much to learn always from you. Well, like we've talked about, you and I, I, I wish um, it was an easy way to do a shorebird walk around here, yeah, but it's so hard because probably the best place to do it is Great Sipawisset Marsh on the Black Beach side and just getting people there and access and, and having an easy way to get there is, is just... It's not easy. No, it's, it's a long walk. Yeah, right. I mean, I can get in there and, and, you know, I know other people that find a way to get in there, but to take a large group in, it's just too tough. Yeah, it's but, tough. You know, it's tough. So we got to settle for a talk about them. Right, right. Well, thank you very much. I need to apologize to a few of you who I left in the waiting room for way too long. I'm not sure how that happened. Um, so I know you missed the first little bit of the talk. If you want to catch it, it will be on our YouTube channel. And the way to find it is to go right to the 300 Committee's website and then scroll down to the bottom and look for the little YouTube logo. Click on that, you'll go right to the 300 Committee's YouTube channel and you'll see this talk and almost all of the other talks that we've hosted in the last, um, what, nine months or so. So uh, feel Sherry free to- mentioned... hmm? Oh, sorry. I, I was just looking at some comments actually. Oh, um, good. Oh, great. Yes, yeah. here's some chat. Great. Yeah, uh, Lynn Sherry mentioned we can kayak to Great Sipawisset Marsh, but even that, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little leery about doing that as a group um, and, and accessing it, but I mean, I love the idea, though. Um, beyond the Red Knot, do you anticipate any other birds to be listed anytime in the near future? Oh, geez. Um, there's a number of them that, are, that aren't doing so well. Um, trying to think um well there i mean they're all in a steady decline pretty much all of them oh back to the oyster catcher somebody said yes i'm going to scroll back now while i'm talking um i'm not sure what the official status is on a couple of them there's the oyster catcher right there in the bottom with a muscle in its bill and there's a big banding program on breeding birds going on in the northeast and I should remember what all those bands mean and, and where they're from and what the process is, but I don't, but just know that there's some research going on and that's why that particular one is banded anyhow. Um, what is the benefit to the birds to change breeding plumage? Um, well, you know, that's a, that's a big question on why birds are colored the way they are. Um, sometimes it, it seems obvious that, you know, it's a big showy look uh, to attract the, the females and the males get all kinds of bright color in the springtime. But why do they, some of them retain it? Why do some of them not have it? And that's a good question. I, to, to, to be honest, 
I'm not certain I I know the answer to that. And and the idea that to uh, be more camouflage and migration, there might be something to that. More subdued tones on the mud flats and in those sort of areas during migration, not the colors aren't as bright, colors aren't as, as vibrant. Um, so there might be something to that, but I, I can't say I know for sure. <clears throat> Question about curlews. Oh, wait a minute, where was that? Was it about a book? Oh no, I, not, I have not read that book, no. Do we get curlews here? No, nope, in fact, uh, there's, there's curlew sandpipers, but yeah, that's a bird that unfortunately is no longer with us, um, at least one of the species. Yeah, there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of bad stuff going on, boy, with habitat and, and climate change. And it, it, you know, I, several years ago, I said that I don't believe we're gonna see any difference in bird populations related to climate change, but I was wrong. Um, we are seeing it now. Um, you know, it, ocean temperatures, um, the what the Russians were, uh, Russian um, scientists were studying in the Arctic up there with uh, the hatch of the insects being much sooner than they used to be, and the birds not capitalizing on that when they need to. Um, you know, what's happening with the horseshoe crab population, um, most speculate has something to do with ocean temperature rise in temperature. Um, so, you know, it, it affects birds. So yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing some changes. A couple more questions, Mike. Something about, uh, can you explain exactly how a bird changes its plumage? Do they drop feathers? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's gradual though. Um, yeah, it doesn't, uh, depending on the species, some of them, lose different parts first. And with shorebirds, I believe when they, when they are on the breeding grounds, some of the, the back and shoulder and, and wing feathers kind of gradually start to molt out, but they are never like missing like chunks of feathers. Like you will see sometimes with cardinals when they just will lose all their head feathers. Uh, like I've never seen that with shorebirds. It's always gradual because they're always on the move and they basically need to have those feathers. So it, it is definitely a gradual sort of thing for sure. So yeah, um, that's the, I guess that's the best I can answer that. Thank you. Also the last, it looks like the last question. Do you think, what do you think could be possible detriment for migrating birds from offshore windmills? Um, I don't know if I can accurately speak to that. Um, I, I do know that a friend of mine was involved with some tracking bird data and migration routes off of Block Island, and it didn't seem to be an issue. The shorebirds migrate at very high altitudes at night, usually at night. And, you know, most of these towers do have lights on top, but from what I understand, most of these shorebirds migrate at high altitudes overnight. Some of these um, windmills offshore, people have been concerned about some other birds, um, waterfowl, um, migrating songbirds, songbirds that get pushed out over the ocean and they don't really want to be pushed out over the ocean. Um, immature birds that try to follow the land mass, but end up out over water and try to make their way back. Um, but I, I, I think the overall opinion is that there has not been a significant impact, especially relatively speaking to all the habitat issues and predation issues and, and the geese issues. And you know, I, I think it, it pales in comparison from, from what I've gathered. Right. Um, okay. Chris has, Chris has piped up oh. a, a mass Audubon study years ago concluded that birds are more at risk from climate change than from offshore turbines, at least off the Cape, as it is not a big shorebird migratory path. All right. Well, there you go. That's kind Thank of what I was so saying, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Yeah. All right. Uh, all right. Well, I guess I will sign off. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone, for being with us tonight. Happy summer. Take care. Take time, take extra time to get where you need to go. <laughs>
<laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.